Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, second live streamed lecture here uh, <clears throat> that we are presenting for Historic St. Mary City. Uh, we typically do three in the fall, so this will be our second one and uh, still finalizing the plans for our third one in November. Uh, but one thing I wanted to, to mention to everybody uh, before we get going is uh, that this year we had big plans. We were uh, supposed to celebrate uh, the 19th Amendment and women's history. And so we had planned that all of our speakers uh, would be female historians and archaeologists. And, and that's what we have. So all of our, if you haven't noticed, the la our last um, presenter and this presenter are, bo are both uh, leading in the field of, of their respective fields and uh, doing cutting edge research on, on the various topics. And so we're really excited to have that. And uh, this this topic about witch bottles is always near and uh, dear to my heart. I always like this time of year. I always like the, the Halloween and uh, legends and lore and a little hocus pocus because that is the name of one of our tours that we do at Historic St. Mary City. And uh, we do that tour every Saturday at 11 and 3 p.m. at the Godiah Spray Tobacco Plantation. So after you watch this presentation and learn more about how which bottles were used in the 17th century, you can go to the Godiah Spray Tobacco Plantation and learn more about the superstitions of the 17th century, uh, because people in that time period were very superstitious and had various beliefs uh, to help them understand their day-to-day -day lives uh, as they were living them. So uh, <clears throat> without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and, and introduce our speaker, Amanda Wells, is a graduate from George Mason University, and she has a passion of history. In 2013, her dedication to protecting Prince William County's history through historic preservation work led to the entry of her name into the congressional record. While serving as the curatorial assistant with the Virginia Beach History Museum for over six years, she first learned about witch bottles, sparking her interest in that topic, and, and from that has gained more and more popularity about witch bottles because more and more of them are continuing to be uncovered. In fact, I think our curator, uh, Silas Hurry, just he emailed me just recently saying that he heard about another witch bottle and wanted to get in contact with Amanda. So I don't know if that's going to be in her presentation or not. So I look forward to hearing if, if that is. Um, but as you can tell, this is a, a very relevant topic today uh, for the timely of the year, but that there's always new studies coming on. So I'm going to go ahead and, and bring Amanda in and her presentation. Hi. How are you doing, Amanda? I'm doing all right. All right. Well, thank you for uh, coming on tonight and joining us and, and our audience to talk about witch bottles. I'm happy and to be here. Just so everyone is aware, uh, on Google or on YouTube, you can uh, type in some questions if you wish. I can get those and I can even share them on our screen. So that way everyone can read the question and Amanda can do that, but we'll hold those till the end of the, of the presentation. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna step on out and uh, take it away, Amanda. So, a sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap and munched and munched and munched. Give me, quoth I, a roint thee witch, the rump fed Rion cries. Her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger, but in a sieve I'll tither sail, and like a rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do, and I'll do. I'll give thee a win, thou art kind, and I another. I myself have all the other, and the very ports that they blow, all the quarters that they know. I the shipman's card, I will drain him dry as hay, sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. He shall live a man forbid, where he said nights nine times nine, shall he dwindle peak. If I said the lines, double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, maybe you might recognize this. This is from Shakespeare's Macbeth, and I thought that this would set the tone nicely tonight. So I would like to thank Peter and Historic St. Mary City at large for inviting me to speak today. This is my first virtual lecture um, I've given, so please bear with me on any kind of technical uh, issues. Uh, it's always so much fun. 
And as Peter mentioned, I am based out of Virginia Beach, but what I'm here to talk about today has been found all over the East Coast, not just Southeastern Virginia. Tonight, we'll learn about a brief history of witchcraft and its migration to what would eventually become the United States, and how the belief in the supernatural led to the desire to protect oneself using a counter magical device known as a witch bottle. Afterwards, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions um, that I'm able to. I am also always still learning, so there's always new information, just like Peter mentioned about the new witch bottle that was found. Uh, I also heard about that today, so unfortunately it's not um, something I'll talk about tonight. However, it is something that is super fascinating. Now, in a non-COVID world, I would generally take a poll but instead, I'd like you to think about the following questions. Have you ever had a stomach ache, especially one that appeared out of seemingly nowhere? Have you ever had a nightmare so real that you thought whatever was tormenting you was in the room with you? This might be a little more personal, so I'm not going to limit it to yourselves. But have you or someone you know ever suffered from kidney stones or a bladder infection. Now, a couple of years ago, I did a very small survey of people and I asked them the very same questions. And these are the results. Most people have experienced stomach issues or had a nightmare at one time. Some people have had sleep paralysis happen and most people have had some sort of bladder issue. Now, these seem like pretty normal questions, uh, the same sort of questions your friends or your doctors might ask if you're feeling unwell. Maybe it's just something genetic that gives you bad nightmares, or maybe it was food poisoning. But have you ever thought that maybe a witch is hexing me? I want to introduce or reintroduce, if you're familiar with them, something called a witch bottle. Bear with me if my PowerPoint wants to move. There we go. Now, I don't want to confuse a witch bottle with a witch ball like these you'll see here. You might have heard of those as well or seen them in various places being sold. Um, they are also sold as offering or ways to protect yourself from a witch. According to the legends, the colors of a witch ball would draw in witches and evil spirits while the strands inside would capture the spirit and stop them from escaping. So they're always are usually always these very colorful balls like you'll see around. Now, another legend with them states that witches would stay away because they didn't have a reflection or they were scared to see their reflection. Now, while witch balls are more commonly known in the United States, it doesn't seem, according to my research, that they're really found in the United States until about the mid-19th century. Um, but they are commonplace in 17th and 18th century Europe. So, what is a witch bottle then? Where a witch ball is typically a hollow sphere of colored glass, a witch bottle is a bottle that has specific contents inside. The name is a little misleading. The bottle is actually made by a victim or a potential victim of a witch, not the witch themselves. It's a form of protection similar to the idea of a witch ball. So this begs the question, if you were to make a device to scare off a witch, what kind of things would you put inside? Well, the most common ingredients of a witch bottle are nails, pins, and of course, urine from the victim. Now, the number of nails and pins can vary from as few as three to several hundred, and pins can also be found straight or even bent. To make a stronger connection to the one casting the hex, you could even add hair or fingernails or navel lint, which I think is one of my favorite ways to put belly button lint. You could also add in toenail clippings if you really wanted. Now, there have been instances of pieces of leather in a heart shape with that is stabbed with pins, um, which might be related to another folk countermeasure uh, against witchcraft. It, wherein the heart of an animal was pierced with pins and needles and then suspended in a chimney. So now you know what goes in a witch bottle. You need to know how it works, right? Well, there's various ways that a witch bottle can be implemented, some defensive and some offensive. 
Several scholars have suggested that when a witch bottle was buried or concealed near a hearth or a threshold, it was a preventative measure that to keep a witch from entering the house and doing harm to the inhabitants. Now, some have even been buried on the outskirts of fields as a way to protect their livestock from bewitchment. Now, the method of burying a witch bottle is also a way to help treat urinary problems such as epilepsy, otherwise known as the fits, uh, and other diseases. A different, more offensive way rather than defensive method of employing a witch bottle was to put a witch bottle close to a fire so the contents begin to boil. In theory, whatever witch is hexing the victim would then appear to the victim with burns on their body begging the victim to stop the counter hex. Witch bottles can also be put further into the fire until they explode, which would theoretically lead to a witch's death, or the bottle could be buried upside down and the urine slowly escapes the cork and that would represent the force of a witch that would drain until she dies, releasing the victim from her spell. Now, the practice of, burying, of boiling the urine in a pan with nails can be traced back to the 16th century. In his 1593 book, A Dialogue Concerning Witches and Witchcraft, George Gifford wrote, But I have heard, I cannot tell how true it is, that therefore there is a further thing which they observe, and that is this, the cunning man biddeth set on a posnet, or some pan with nails, and seeth them, and the witch shall come in while they be in seething, and within a few days after her face will be all scratched with the nails. Now this is very similar to the practice that I mentioned earlier of placing a bottle close to a fire so that it begins to boil. In less than a hundred years, the practice moves from pans to bottles. In 1671, Joseph Blagrave wrote in his book, The Astrological Practice of Physic, stop the urine of the patient close up in a bottle and put into it three nails, pins, or needles with a little white salt, keeping the urine always warm. Joseph Glanville's 1681 book, Seducimus Triumphatus, or Evidence Concerning Witches and Apparitions, tells a very interesting story of events that supposedly happened sometime in the early 17th century in Suffolk, England. The short tale goes as such. For an old man that traveled up and down the country and had some acquaintance at that house, calling in and asking the man of the house how he did and his wife, he told him that himself was well, but his wife had been of a long time in a languishing condition and that she was haunted with a thing in the shape of a bird that would flur near to her face and that she could not enjoy her natural rest well. The old man bid him and his wife be of good courage. It was but a dead sprite, he said, and he would put him in a course to rid his wife of this languishment and trouble. He therefore advised him to take a bottle and put his wife's urine in it together with pins and needles and nails, and cork them up and set the bottle to the fire well corked. Which, when it had felt a little while the heat of the fire, began to move and joggle a little. But he for sureness took the fire shovel and held it hard upon the cork. And as he thought, he felt something, one while on this side, another while on that, shoved the fire shovel off, which he quickly put on again. But at last, at one shoving, the cork bounced out, and the urine, pins, nails, and needles all flew up and gave a report like a pistol, and his wife continued in the same trouble trouble and languishment still. Not long after, the old man came to the house again and inquired of the man of the house how his wife did, who answered, as ill as ever, if not worse. He asked him if he had followed his directions. Yes, says he, and told him the event as, as above said. Ha, quoth he, it seems it was too nimble for you, but now I will put you in a way that will make the business sure. Take your wife's urine as before and cork it in a bottle with nails, pins, and needles and bury it in the earth. That will do the feat. The man did accordingly and his wife began to mend sensibly and in a competent time was finally well recovered. But there came an outcry, there came a woman from a town some miles off to the, their house with a lamentable outcry that he, that they had killed her husband. They asked her what she had meant, and she saith, 
cheat. You have killed my husband. He told me so on his deathbed. But at last they understood by her that her husband was a wizard and he had bewitched this man's wife and that this counter practice prescribed by the old man, which had saved the man's wife from languishment, was the death of that wizard which had be bewitched her. It's definitely a riveting bedtime story, right? Now, protections such as witch bottles were common in the 17th and even into the 18th century England. But why? What happens that makes people want to protect themselves against what we think of today as a story we would tell around the fire? It's not like the ideas of witches and sorcery were new concepts. When the witch hunts began, they could be found in stories and in some cases just down the road from you. Someone who is believed to be able to cure diseases or counter malevolent sorcery, otherwise known as a cunning man or a cunning woman. During the 14th and 15th centuries, the idea of witchcraft underwent a drastic change. Instead of the idea that a witch was deceived by the devil into practicing magic that went against the powers of God, they believed that witches were all-out devil worshippers who had renounced Christianity and had made a pact with him, which then gained them new supernatural powers to bring down Christians, including the possibility of turning other Christians into devil worshippers. If we turn to George Gifford's book again, which is written in a dialogue between two men, Samuel and Daniel, we can see this conflict. Daniel, or sorry, Samuel confides in Daniel that his mind is troubled. He believes that they live in a bad country, but not because of all the swearers, liars, railers, slanders, or drunks. It's what Daniel mentions that some bad things have happened to him. And it's not a whole lot, it's just a few odd things, but he's convinced that it's because of an old woman. Daniel asks if Samuel, if he knows of a cunning man or a woman that he can go to, and Samuel explains that, well, there's several, but he doesn't know which to go to or if he even wants to go that route. Daniel eventually says he believes that Samuel is bewitched, which of course scares Samuel. But Daniel explains further. I do not think that the old woman hath bewitched you, or that your body is bewitched, but that the devil hath bewitched your mind with blindness and unbelief to draw you from God, even to worship himself by seeking help at the hands of devils. It is a lamentable case to see how the devil hath bewitched thousands at this day to run after him, and even to offer sacrifice unto him. Now, the Malaeus Maleficarum, or Hammer of the Witches, is a book written in 1482 and published in Germany a year later by Heinrich Kramer. He was a member of the Dominican Order and an Inquisitor, and this book helps to fuel, add fuel to these tensions. This book was written after Kramer was actually expelled from the city of Innsbruck and labeled by the local bishop as senile and crazy because he tried to prosecute alleged witches in the area. Kramer then decided to seek approval from Pope Innocent VIII for explicit authority to prosecute witchcraft. And in 1484, the Pope issued Sumus Desiderantes Effectibus, which means desiring with supreme ardor. It's a papal bull which simply reaffirmed for anybody in doubt, such as the local bishop, that Kramer's powers to deal with witchcraft and heresy are absolute. This papal bull is actually posted in the front of the Malaeus Maleficarum and goes so far as to outline what a witch is and what they can do with their abilities. So the papal bull explains that many persons of both sexes, unmindful of their own salvation and straying from the Catholic faith, have abandoned themselves to devils, incubi, and succubi, and by their incantations, spells, and conjurations, and other accursed charms and crafts, enormities and horror defenses have slain infants yet in the mother's womb and also the offspring of cattle have blasted the produce of the earth the grapes of the vine the fruits of the tree nay men and women beasts of burden herd beasts as well as animals of other kinds vineyards orchards meadows pasture land corn wheat and all other cereals so of course this is all starting to build up. So due to these religious tensions in England during the 16th and 17th centuries, King Henry VIII's Witchcraft Act of 1542 is the first in England to define witchcraft as a felony. 
It is a crime punishable by death in the forfeiture of the convicted felon's goods and chattels. This act also removes the benefit of clergy for those convicted of witchcraft. Benefit of clergy is a legal device that would spare anyone from hanging who is able to read a passage from the Bible. Now, according to the 1542 Act, it was forbidden to use, devise, practice, or exercise, or cause to be devised, practiced, exercised, or any invocations of conjurations of spirits, witchcraft, enchantments, or sorceries to intend to find money, treasure, or to waste, consume, destroy any person in his body members, or to provoke any person to unlawful love, or for any other unlawful intent or purpose, or for despite of Christ, or for monetary gain, dig up, or pull down any cross or crosses, or by such invocations or conjurations of spirits, witchcraft, enchantments, or sorceries, or any of them take upon them to tell or declare where good, stolen, or lost shall become. They really tried to cover the gambit in that one. Now, speaking of royalty, King James VI of Scotland and the I of England had his own personal encounters with witchcraft. Three years before his birth, under his mother, Mary Queen of Scots, reign, the Scottish Witchcraft Act of 1563 was passed, more for prevention than in reaction to witches at the time. Now, this is the same year that Mary's cousin, Queen Elizabeth I of England, passes another witchcraft act in England, the second one for the country, but certainly not the last. King James marries Princess Anne of Denmark in 1589 in Copenhagen by proxy, which just means that they weren't married in person. And when Anne, Anne goes to sail uh, to Scotland shortly after to be with her husband, she had to abandon her travels on the coast. Uh, of Norway, because all these sea storms decided to appear suddenly. And even though they had outfitted the ship for this journey and for any storms, they had to abandon their trip because it was just so bad. Now, this upsets James, and he is compelled to go and fetch his wife. So after being officially married in person, after he uh, goes over to Oslo, Norway, they return to Copenhagen, where witch trials are actually in full swing. It's actually discovered that a coven of witches claim to be the ones that conjure up the sea storms to prevent Anne from reaching James. Now, the accused witches were executed before James and Anne made their return trip to Scotland. So, once in Scotland, it seemed as though the witches from Copenhagen had actually followed the monarchs. A maid named Gilly Duncan was accused by her employer of being a witch because he claimed that she had suddenly gained miraculous healing abilities and that she snuck out at night. Now, eventually, the maid confessed. Of course, she had been tortured up until that point until she confessed. So not only does she confess that she's a witch, she also says that there's actually a coven of witches. And they were actually in league with the Copenhagen witches to prevent Anne from coming over. Among the accused is Agnes Sampson. She's an elderly midwife. And it is said that King James himself is the one who actually questioned Agnes regarding her role in the storms raising and did not find her guilty of being a witch. In fact, he called the, not just Agnes, but the others who have been telling all these crazy stories about what the witches have done and what they've conjured, he actually called them extreme liars because the things that they were saying were so miraculous and so strange. However, Agnes wanted him to believe her, and according to the report from the News from Scotland, which was a pamphlet written in 1591, Agnes had taken his majesty a little aside, and she declared unto him the very words which passed between the king's majesty and his queen in Oslo in Norway the first night of their marriage. This, reputa this repetition of King James and Queen Anne's pillow talk from their marriage night was enough to convince James that Agnes was guilty. She was a witch, is what he found, and she was garroted, which is being strangled to death. Uh, and then she was burnt at stake, which was a common practice in Scotland. According to the pamphlet, when the witches of North Berwick Kirk asked, uh, asked the devil who they had sworn allegiance to by kissing his buttocks, why the devil has such hatred for King James, the devil replied, the king is the greatest enemy he hath in the world. 
Now, these trials were the first major persecution of witches in Scotland under the Witchcraft Act of 1563. And they were nor known as the North Berwick Witch Trials. Heavily influenced by these trials uh, and his involvement in them, King James writes Demonology. This book is supposed to educate the public on the history, the practices, and the implications of witchcraft and the reasons to persecute a witch in a Christian society. It is still widely used today when referring to the witch hunts of this period, and it's also believed to be one of the main sources that Shakespeare used in the, pro in the production of Macbeth. The passage I read when I began tonight speaks of a tempest or a sea storm brewed up by witches. This is a play that King James himself would have seen. Was Shakespeare making mention to the storm that tried to keep James from his queen? In 1604, a year following his coronation as King of England, James passes his own witchcraft act, the third one for England, entitled An Act Against Conjuration, Witchcraft, and Dealing with Evil and Wicked Spirits. Now, this act broadens the previous witchcraft acts in England to include the penalty of death without benefit of clergy to anyone who invoked evil spirits or communicated with familiar spirits. Burning at the stake is also eliminated, except in cases of witchcraft, which were also petty treason. Now, I don't know if anybody has actually seen the movie Witchfinder General. It's a 1968 movie featuring Vincent Price. It is actually based on a real person, Matthew Hopkins, who roamed East Anglia, which includes the counties of Norfolk and Suffolk on the east of England, and is believed to, he is also believed to have been responsible for the deaths of 300 women, suspected witches, between 1644 and 1646. If you're a big fan of Vincent Price, I highly recommend watching it. It's not historically accurate. It's almost like watching... Um, Disney's Pocahontas and saying that that's historically accurate, but it is definitely entertaining and not one that many people uh, know about or like to watch. It's King James 1604 Witchcraft Act that Matthew Hopkins enforces during these years of operation. Matthew Hopkins would use techniques such as denying food to a suspect, various methods of sleep deprivation, forcing his subjects to walk or run for hours upon hours, and tying his suspects to a chair in uncomfortable positions for hours in order to extract confessions from suspected witches. He would also look for a devil's mark or a witch's mark. This was usually defined as a mark, a mole, or even a nipple, which did not normally occur, which was where a witch's familiar would suckle blood from uh, the witch. If no visible one was found, you could always find an invisible one. So they would employ prickers, which would have long needles, and they would start pricking the skin until they found a place which did not bleed, nor did it have any kind of pain, and that was an invisible witch mark. Another method was to swim them or duck them in water to see if the water would reject them. If a witch had renounced their baptism, the water would cast them out and would, and would not let the witch sink into water, as water is a pure substance. This method was actually something that Matthew Hopkins and his associate John Stern had been warned against using because some considered it inhumane. Stern even remarks on this warning in his 1648 book, A Confirmation and Discovery of Witchcraft, wherein he writes, but because it is held unlawful, I should be sorry to speak anything, whether to give offense to any or to be a means to animate in any such courses. Now, I'm sure by now you're wondering why I've rambled on for so long, giving a very brief <laughs> history of witchcraft in England and Europe and what happened to the whole talk about witch bottles. But of course... With that background, it should come as no surprise that nearly 200 examples of witch bottles have been found in England, with a majority of them being found in East Anglia, where Matthew Hopkins roamed the, roamed the lands hunting down witches. But where does that leave the newly settled New World? More importantly, where does that, what does that have to do with the Chesapeake Bay area? So let's start with something we're all familiar with. What would you consider the most famous witch hunt and trials in the United States? Now, if you said the Salem Witch Trials, you're going to be correct. The Salem Witch Trials took place between 1692 and 1693. Now, almost anybody I've talked to has never heard of a witch bottle 
ever making an appearance in the Salem Witch Trials. This is where we would expect to see one, especially in the United States. Now, we know similar to what happens in England, there's a religious fear that people are communing with the devil and a group of young girls in Salem Village accuse several local women of communicating and worshiping the devil. In fact, over 150 men, women, and children are accused. 19 suspected witches were hanged, one man was pressed to death, and several people died in jail. Now, this is where I kind of get on my soapbox a little bit. To reiterate the statistics, 19 suspected witches were hanged, one man was pressed to death, and several people died in jail. Is there something you're not hearing there? probably burning at the stake. Uh, no witches, as far as I am aware, were ever burned in the United States, and definitely not at Salem. This is after the 1604 Witchcraft Act that eliminates burning at the stake. Burning at the stake was a European thing uh, for the most part. Now, Roger Toothaker, a farmer and a folk healer, was arrested for witchcraft on May 18, 1692, after being accused by witchcraft of witchcraft by Elizabeth Hubbard, Ann Putnam Jr., and Mary Walcott. He is not executed for this because he's one of the people that actually dies in jail. The only piece of testimony from his case that remains is a testimony from Thomas Gage against Roger Toothaker, which includes the following. Toothaker said that his daughter had killed a witch, and I asked him how she, how she did it, and said Toothaker answered readily that his daughter had learned something from him. I asked by what means she did it, and he said that there was a certain person bewitched, and said person complained of being afflicted by another person that was suspected that was suspected by the afflicted person, and farther said Toothaker said that his daughter had got some of the afflicted person's urine and put it into an earthen pot and stopped said pot very close and put said pot very close to a hot oven and stopped up said oven and the next morning said which was dead other things I have forgotten and farther said not. Now, that sounds a little familiar if you were listening to the very beginning. Thomas Gage points out that Roger Toothaker admits that he and his daughter practiced counter magic against witches by building a witch bottle to eliminate a witch. Cotton Mather, son of Increase Mather, cautioned the judges in Salem against using specter evidence, which was the testimony of a victim of witchcraft that they had been, uh, was the testimony of a victim of witchcraft that they had been attacked by a specter bearing the appearance of someone that they knew. It's his writings on witchcraft, a particular case in Boston, actually, that may have actually fed the hysteria that resulted in the Salem Witch Trials. After the trials in 1693, Cotton Mather wrote a book called The Wonders of the Invisible World, where he denounces the use of counter magic, such as a witch bottle that Roger Toothaker used. He writes, the devil is pleased and honored when any of his institutions are made use of. His way of discovering, or this way of discovering, which is, is no better than that of putting the urine of the afflicted person into a bottle so that the witch may be tormented and discovered. The vanity and superstition of witch practice I have formerly shewed and testified against. In other words, performing counter magic against a witch is no different than being a witch in Cotton Mather's eyes. Now, this is something that his father, Increase Mather, also wrote about roughly 10 years prior. Increase explains that by trying to heal a person by throwing the thing bewitched into the fire or the urine of the sick stopped in a bottle or a horseshoe nailed before the door, they've obtained their good health by Satan's help. According to Increase, the witch cannot recover them but by the devil's help. Hence, as it is unlawful to entreat witches to heal bewitched persons, because they cannot do this but by Satan, so it is very sinful by scratching or burnings or detention of urine to endeavor to constrain them to bewitch any, for this is to put them upon seeking the devil. The witch does neither inflict nor remove the disease, but by the assistance of the devil. Therefore, either to desire or force thereunto is to make use of the devil's help. Now, there's many accounts of witch bottles being used in the United States, brought here by settlers to the country, not just in the 17th and 18th centuries, but even into the early parts of the 20th century. 
So witch bottles are certainly something that exists in the United States, even in the modern age. But why haven't we really heard about them? Remember, I said that there's been nearly 200 found in England. So how many do you think have been found in the United States? Now, normally I would say eight, but we have been constantly finding more and more. This map here is a 2012 map that shows locations of witch bottles that have been recovered in the United States. Now, we kind of mentioned there was one in Maryland just found, and in Virginia, January of this year, uh, near Williamsburg, they found another one that dates back to the Civil War. But why is there still such a massive difference in numbers? Scholars don't actually have an exact reason. Uh, there are two possibilities that seem to be the leading theories. First, that the witch bottles in the United States might have been mostly bottles that were placed in fire and meant to explode. So once they explode, then they no longer exist. Secondly, it's possible that archeologists were originally just unfamiliar with them and what they were finding. Uh, they might have thought that it was some rubbish um, or just kind of a cast off thing and didn't realize at the time what it was. Now that's an important part to, or important thing to remember as I continue. The earliest account of a witch bottle in the United States is actually traced to Boston, Massachusetts in 1681. A man named Michael Smith went to the house of the widow Han Hannah Weakham and told, him, told her that he was very sick and that Goody Hale had bewitched him. Now, Smith had been living in the house of Mary Hale called Goody because uh, she was a married Puritan woman. According to Smith, Hale got upset that she was that he was planning to marry a woman named Margaret Ellis rather than her granddaughter. They had an argument and eventually to try to appeal Hale, appease Hale, sorry. He drank a cup of ale with her. Um, and, but shortly after, he actually became violently ill. He told this to Weakham, who was a healer of sorts, and in order to find out who was tormenting him, she had him lay in bed at her home and took the water of said Michael and closed it in a bottle, then locked the bottle in a cupboard. Mary Hale soon appeared at the door and she did not cease walking to and fro about the house until Weakham uncorked the bottle and Hale went home, confirming their suspicions that Hale bewitched Smith. While Smith was at Weakham's home, Hale made a caudal, which is a warm drink for the sick, and sent it to Smith. He refused to accept it, wise, until Margaret Ellis, the woman he intended to marry, made him believe that she had actually made it himself. That night, he had a severe nightmare and eventually woke, calling for Hale's immediate arrest because he claimed that Hale had actually appeared to him in the night and taken him to a witch's banquet. In the end, the case was not strong enough for the jurors and Mary Hale was acquitted. Now, although that's the earliest account of a witch bottle, the earliest American witch bottle identified is known as the Essington Witch Bottle, which was identified by archaeologist Marshall Becker in Delaware County, Pennsylvania in 1976. It's dated circa 1740, and it's a dark green wine bottle that was tightly sealed with a whittled wood stopper and contains six brass pins and found buried in an inverted position in a small hole near the base of a chimney. Still, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania aren't Virginia. They're not Hampton Roads, so where I'm located. So what about witches here? How did I fall into the deep pool of witchcraft in Colonial Virginia? It's not something that we typically hear about in the Colonial 757, but in 1626, over 60 years before Salem, in Hampton, Virginia, in the area once known as Kikatan, uh, the first recorded witch trial in any English colony took place. Joan Wright was accused of predicting the deaths of three men in her neighborhood, bewitching Sergeant Booth. So despite having very game, very fair game to shoot, he should never kill anything. Bewitching pigs and threatening to make Miss Elizabeth Gates dance naked and stand before the tree and also causing the death of an infant. Excuse me. Mrs. Wright was also accused of knowing a counter charm to get rid of magically induced illness, flinging a hot horseshoe into a container of the victim's urine. Sounds a little slightly familiar. Heat, iron, and urine? Well, we've come right back around to those earlier descriptions of counter magic. Miss Wright was not convicted, perhaps due to her husband Robert testifying on her behalf. 
There's also the story of Alice Cartwright, who was accused of being a witch and requested that she be searched for marks to clear her name. Her court case in 1678 reads, in the defense between John Salmon, plaintiff against Alice, the wife of Thomas Cartwright, defendant, a jury, a jury of women being in panel did an open court upon their oaths declared that they having diligently searched the body of the said Alice can find no suspicious marks whereby they can judge her to be a witch, but only what may and is usual on women. It is therefore the judgment of the court and ordered that she be acquitted and her husband's bond given for her appearance to be given up. Now I'm sure whenever we picture a person who dabbles in witchcraft, we think of women. And women were, of course, the vast majority of those accused of being witches. However, men are also accused of performing witchcraft. William Harding from Northumberland County in Virginia was one accused of witchcraft, sorcery, etc. According to a 1656 court case, several pieces of evidence or articles were presented to the court. An able jury of 24 men impaneled to try the matter by verdict of which jury they found of the articles proven approved by several dispositions, the court doth therefore order that the said William Harding shall forthwith receive ten stripes upon his bare back and forever to be banished this county, and that he depart within the space of two months, and also to pay all of the charges of the court. Many witchcraft cases in the Chesapeake area, and yes, it's not limited to just those cases I've named, there's actually many more, are actually more reverse witch trials. And what I mean by that is that the case was brought to the court generally by the supposed witch and not the victim. And it's usually the witch suing her accusers for slander rather than her accusers just bringing them to court because they're a witch. For instance, in 1655, the court in Lower Norfolk County heard charges against Ann Gobby. And the case was concerning some slanders and scandals cast upon women under the notion of witches have contemptuously acted in abusing and taking the good name and credit of Nicholas Robinson's wife. She was found guilty and her husband Thomas was ordered to pay a fine of 300 pounds of tobacco and pay for all court costs. Another interesting thing about witches in this area is that they are usually accused of targeting a victim's body and or agriculture. So a victim's health and their wealth not so much about con conspiring with Satan, and they don't usually work in covens. So why have I been talking about witch bottles this whole time? There's no witch bottles mentioned in Mrs. Wright's case, but it does include a counter magic charm that sounds loosely sim similar to the origins of a witch bottle. There's no mention of witch bottles in Alice Cartwright or William Harding's case either. So to answer this question, I actually need to take you back, 40 back in time about 40 years. In the fall of 1979, an archaeology volunteer, Keith White, was done working at what is known as the Great Neck Archaeology Site in present-day Virginia Beach, not too terribly far from Cape Henry. He was an avid beachcomber and loved to pick through ancient rubbish, looking for old things, seashells, fossils. On this particular day, he decided to explore an area that both he and the archaeology team had already explored before. This area was once a part of the land grant of Thomas Keeling and contained a 17th century structure at one point that might have been the dwelling of the Keelings. Now, as he explored, White's only find that day was a medicine file that was buried bottom up in the soil a few inches away from the edge of a 30-foot cliff, where after a few more months of soil erosion, the bottle would have no doubt dropped into the ocean. Now, the bottle had a cloudy white film around the inside, making it impossible for him to see the contents within, and its stopper had long since disappeared, replaced with what seemed to be dirt. It appeared just to be a cast-off bottle, maybe nothing more than rubbish or something accidentally lost. So he took the bottle home and rinsed the interior off with Tarnax, which was a silver cleaner, and that's when he discovered what was inside and quickly stopped uh, cleaning the bottle. The next day, he arrived at the job site and excitedly took the bottle to Floyd Painter, a local archaeologist who led many different excavations around the Virginia Beach area, and uh, which includes the Thurgood House, which is one of the former historic houses I worked at until earlier this year. White showed Floyd Painter the bottle and wanted to know what the bottle was. Inside, he had found pins, and Painter had theorized that perhaps one of the killing women had kept her pin supply in the bottle and congratulated White for not removing the pins. Of course, as they all excitedly looked at the bottle, they were joined by George Herbert, a newspaper editor and non-professional archaeologist, who had chimed in with a, hey, I know what that is. Herbert had just read an article in the Pennsylvania Archaeologist about a witch bottle that had been found somewhere in Pennsylvania, the Essington witch bottle. 
After explaining what a witch bottle was, both Herbert and Painter looked at each other and said, Gray Sherwood. Now, some of you may be familiar with the legend of Gray Sherwood, uh, otherwise known as the Witch of Pungo. If not, no worries. She is not as famous as Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And if you're a frequent traveler to Virginia Beach, you might perhaps recognize Witch Duck Road or a name for an event in Gray Sherwood's life. Or perhaps you might have gone to bingo at Witch Duck Hall. So many people who hear Witch Duck envision the cute duck dressed as a witch shown here. And of course, that's just the cute Disney version. Locals or frequent visitors to Virginia Beach may have heard legends about Grace Sherwood, such as Grace shrinking down to fit into an eggshell before she used the shell to sail across the Atlantic, to re retrieve a sprig of rosemary, and to bring it back to Virginia Beach. All in one night, of course. However, there are some people who aren't aware of these legends. <coughs> Sorry and cute duck cartoon are they're not aware that it's actually tied to a real person who lived in what would become virginia beach now grace was no stranger to the courts of princess anne county which later became virginia beach eventually grace and her husband james filed two slander suits in september 1698 against people from their neighborhood the gisbornes and the barneses who had accused grace of witchcraft citing specific acts of maleficium that she supposedly committed against them. The Gisborns claimed that she had bewitched their pigs to death and bewitched their crop, which had caused them to lose money. Elizabeth Barnes had claimed that Grace came up to her in the night and rode her like a horse before escaping through the keyhole or cracking the door like a black cat. Despite every other known Virginia civil case concerning witchcraft, typically resulting in dismissal or judgment <clears throat> sorry in favor of the plaintiff the sherwood the sherwoods lost both of their cases some years later in 1705 after her husband had passed away grace sued luke hill and his wife elizabeth for assault and battery alleging that elizabeth had assaulted bruised maimed and barbarously beaten her she won her case against the hills but this was only awarded one pound of the 50 pound sterling that she sought this case led to Luke Hill requesting the judges of uh, the justices to initiate criminal proceedings against Grace on the grounds that she had been for a long time suspected of witchcraft and claimed that Grace had bewitched his wife, which was a major factor in the assault case. Now, this led to Grace Sherwood being commanded to return to court at a later date to be searched by a jury of women for witches marks. In March, a jury of 12 women were brought to examine Grace, the four women of which was Elizabeth Barnes, who, if you remember, had once accused Grace of riding her in the night. Unsurprisingly, they soon reported that she had found two witch marks on Grace. The magistrates were still reluctant to initiate criminal proceedings, and eventually Luke Hill insisted that she stand trial and petition the governor's council in Williamsburg to prosecute her as a witch in the general court. The attorney general rejected the request, saying that the, char the charge was too general because she had only been tried for suspicion of being a witch, not an actual act of witchcraft. Now, they then instructed the justices of Princess Anne County to look into the matter further. The justices of Princess Anne County followed the method number 15 in Michael Dalton's The Country Justice, a book which they typically consulted for legal proceedings to find evidence against a suspected witch, which is listed above here. Upon the apprehension of any suspected, to search also their houses diligently for pictures of clay or wax, etc., cut hair bones, powders, books of witchcraft charms, and for pots or places where their spirits may be kept, the smell of which place will stink detestably. They sent deputies to search Grace's house in all suspicious places carefully for all images and such like things as may any way strengthen the suspicion. While she was in the sheriff's safe custody, until she shall give bond and security for her appearance in the next court. Of course, there were several evidences gathered from witnesses, including Luke Hill. The justices also tried to impanel a second jury of women to search for marks on Grace once again. However, this time, the local women refused to serve on the jury, whether out of fear or pity, despite the threat of being held in contempt of court. This time, the justices decided to take it a step further. Despite it being illegal by this time, the court decided Grace would undergo trial by water and would be ducked, as recommended by Matthew Hopkins and King James. 
In order to do this, however, they had to seek Grace's consent for the test. Grace agreed, and probably in the hopes that this would finally just put the matter to bed. After postponement due to bad weather for her safety, Grace was stripped down to her shift. A rope was tied around her waist to keep her from drowning. Her right thumb was tied to her left big toe, and her left thumb was tied to her right big toe before she was thrown into the water with men holding on to ends of the rope tied to her waist. Supposedly, Grace floated unnaturally on top of the water. This event is where we get Witch Duck Road and the cute cartoon duck from in Virginia Beach. Once she was swam in the river, a jury of fine, five ancient and knowing women searched her once more for witch's marks. These women declared an oath that she is not like them nor any other woman that they know of because she had two things that looked like teats on her private parts. The justices put her in the county jail to await a criminal trial in the general court in Williamsburg. But there's no existing records to tell us what happened to Grace at that time. Unfortunately, many of Virginia's colonial records moved to Richmond once the capital moved to Richmond. And during the Civil War, Richmond burned, so many of those records were actually lost. However, we do know that she wasn't executed, as no Virginia witchcraft case re uh, resulted in an execution, and that she lived to her death in 1740. Now, with a witch bottle found in the Virginia Beach area that dates to 1690, from about 1690 to 1750, it does bear the question, was this a result of a resident of Princess Anne County who was scared that Grace Sherwood or someone like her would hex them. The witch bottle is known as the Great Neck Bottle and it is now on display at the Thorogood House Education Center. So if you're ever in Virginia Beach, please come to check it out, see if the site is open. It is really cool. I, I have gotten to hold it. It is fantastic. I love it. Now, of course, I can't leave here today without bringing up Maryland. In fact, there have been several witch bottles found in Maryland. We kind of just mentioned one earlier um, that there was found one there was one found recently uh, you may have seen some of the green dots earlier on that earlier map uh, one of the sites where a witch bottle was found is quite close to historic St. Mary's City at the 17th century archaeological site of Patuxent Point and you can totally correct me if I butchered that um, it's in Calvert County, Maryland, and there were four case bottles found in a small pit near a possible chimney or entranceway into an earth vast house. And in the same pit, three corroded nail fragments, a pig's pelvic bone, and the lower jaw of a small mammal were also found. Additionally, at what is now known as Oxen Hill Plantation or Addison Plantation, Three wine bottles were found buried at the top of the passageway leading from the cellar of a structure that was similar to where the bottles were found at the Pawtuxet Point site. There were no additional finds besides the bottles, but their intentional inverted position suggests a possible protective charm. There's also a bottle found in Maryland at the White Oak site in Dorchester County. This is an 18th century site. It produced a wine bottle neck horseshoe, bottle glass sherds, and bone fragments by a brick hearth. Inside and outside of a solid stopper in the bottle were several straight and, and straight and bent pins. Now, as I mentioned, accounts of witch bottles in the United States don't end in the 18th century, so I want you to take this account. In 1935, Harry Middleton Hyatt wrote Folklore from Adams County, Illinois, in which he recorded stories from local residents, including this one. We had a neighbor who we thought was bewitching my son. So I took a bottle and got a paper of pins and put them in the bottle. Then I put my urine in and corked that bottle up and put it down in the cellar in a dark place. And sure enough, that neighbor came to our house with her face all full of little pinholes. And my son got well after that. 1935. That's less than 100 years ago. In fact, the practice does continue today. I've spoken with modern practicing witches who have told me that they themselves make counter magical devices such as witch bottles, although they have varying ingredients. This, of course, is exactly what Cotton and Increase Mather warned against, so I'm sure they're clutching their spiritual pearls somewhere. These devices and charms can be called a good number of names, and similar devices and charms can be found in other practices in various cultures. So I'll leave you with this. So sorry. The next time you have a stomach ache out of nowhere or experience a nightmare, you know, 
where you've been made a mare or a horse in the middle of the night by a hex, like Elizabeth Barnes, perhaps there might be something a little more supernatural at work. After all, witch bottles and certainly witches are no stranger in the Chesapeake Bay region. Now, a lot of people have asked uh, me to list out the primary sources that I have. And so these are here. So I will leave it there for a minute and I will turn everybody back to Peter. All right. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> That was uh, very interesting, and uh, uh, I think gave a, a good breadth of history of, of the understanding of the, the cultural uh, views of witchcraft as far as the English society and Scottish society are concerned, and then translated over into the American colonies. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, I was working at Colonial Williamsburg when the governor of Virginia officially um, pardoned the Dock Witch of Virginia. Yes. So that, yes. that was quite recent, actually, about 14 years ago, 13 mm -hmm. years ago. And I would also uh, not want to forget uh, Rebecca Fowler. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with her or not, Amanda, but um, mm -hmm. she is the only woman who was uh, tried found guilty and executed for witchcraft in Maryland in the 17th century. And it, um, the anniversary of her execution was actually just last week on the 9th. It's perfect timing. <laughs> it is. And, and, it, and it's, it, it's sad. I'm glad that you did this, but it, it, it's also sad because mm -hmm. um, I'm also reminded that uh, we had scheduled, uh, you know, the pandemic has changed a lot of things and canceled a lot of our programs and this uh upcoming friday and saturday is when we were supposed to do our uh, murder magic and mayhem tour which is an adults only tour where we do talk about rebecca fowler and, and witchcraft in maryland in the 17th century and the different ways that people could try to spot a witch by like you know putting a broomstick in front of her or a colander in front of her mm -hmm. or him yeah <laughs> there were also men um so we did have uh, one question. We had to let's see here. Me get this one question. Um, I think I know the answer to this. I don't know if you will. Let's let's see. Is this oh. the Cry Witch Show at Colonial Williamsburg? So the Cry Witch Show is based on Grace Sherwood. It's based on the trial of Grace Sherwood. It's a little bit more um, sensationalized, if you will. Uh, it is an interesting show for sure. But that one is based on Grace Sherwood, the Witch of Pungo. All right, thank you. Let's see. Do we have any other questions? Oh, well, lots of people commenting about. Uh, a couple of people said that they excavated a witch bottle in Rhode Island mm -hmm. in the 1980s. Another person uh, found in Danville at the Fern Cemetery a few years ago. I don't know if that's Danville, Virginia, oh, or. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other than that, we don't have too many questions other than people saying thank you. This was an excellent presentation. A gentleman by the name of Alex D says, hey there. Oh, hey, Alex. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. no other questions. And, and yeah. I, I think you did a very good job covering everything. Thank I, you. I think, you know, uh, especially dispelling some of the more common misconceptions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, especially like uh, making sure people understand that burning witches at the stake was not that common as far as the English people are concerned. Yeah, that's been or, one of my big soapboxes <laughs> for a while. Or or another one that I I always like to remind people um, to put put things in perspective. And I thought that's where you were going when you started saying how many people actually died mm -hmm. in Salem. When you compare that to the previous century in Germany. Oh, yeah. It's a tenth of a percentile mm -hmm. what happened in Germany. And almost whole villages in Germany were wiped out of people accusing each other of witchcraft and, and then being mm -hmm. executed. Even when you compare what Matthew Hopkins did in the few years that he was in operation, that's like 300 women that 
that's so many compared to 19 people at Salem. Yeah. Uh, and then you're trying to figure out why it all happened. What was going on? And, you know, that's still the mm -hmm. common thing. What happened in Salem? Was it, was it bad bread? Was it, I, I <laughs> tend to think more of on the, on the base level that it had more to do with land and certain people had land that other people wanted. And the best way to yeah. get the land was to get rid of the people. I've definitely heard about the, the fungus theory and was everybody high when, <laughs> when this was going down? Oh, we have a, another question. Uh, I'll show this one. That is a good question. Uh, any local sources or books on local bottles? Not that I know of. I don't think that there's anybody who's done um, just a straight book on them. Um, there is a great thesis that somebody wrote. Uh, it is M. Chris Manning. If you search M. Chris Manning. It's called Homemade Magic Concealed Deposits in Architectural Context in Eastern United States. It's a long name, but it's on that resource list. So when you rewatch this later, because I know you're just going to put it on repeat, <laughs> you can look at my resource list and it is listed on there. Um, they did an excellent job um, compiling history of not just uh, which bottles, but other concealed objects, like concealed shoes and concealed cats, which is such like a sad story for me. Like, I don't even want to touch on that one. All right. And uh, another person uh, paying attention uh, to the map wanted to know about Lewis, Delaware. Is that where it was? Uh, I do not have that off the top of my head. Um, that report, that same one by uh, Chris Manning, goes into a little bit more detail about each one that's on that map. It's got a great like chart, and it says where the witch bottle was found, what was found in it, was it found around certain things. I think it might even give the archaeological site number. Well, that's a little more complicated. <laughs> All right. And before we go, I had a couple other questions that um, I think people want to get in contact with you. Yep. Uh, they asked about an email address. Is there a possibility to, to passing out your email address? Um, yep. I don't, I mean, that's up to you or if you want, I, I can, I, I can put my, my uh, work email address and they can contact me and then I can forward that email to you, Amanda. So that way your nope. email is not being blasted or if you want. I, I don't mind. You guys can have my email. If, if you're ready, I will let you guys know, uh, or you can type it into the chat. It's going to be Wells, W E L L S A R eight at gmail.com. And if, if you do email me and you want that resource list that has all of that um, that primary source and that thesis, I will be more than happy to send that. All right. So I, I put your email address in the chat so that way if anybody wants to, since you said that's okay. And if you guys want to donate a witch bottle to me, please do. <laughs> I will take them. All right. Well, I, I think a lot of people had a... Uh, a nice uh, time with this lecture. And uh, thank you so much, Amanda. I'm going to have to go back and rewatch this yeah. <laughs> again because uh, you can cover a lot of, of ground and I wasn't able to take as good notes as I would like. So oh, yeah. nope. it's a good thing. Um, and for our audience out there, this is be, this will be recorded and live on Historic St. Mary City's YouTube channel indefinitely. So you can always share it um, and rewatch it again. And uh, if you want to support any of our lectures or any of the other things that we do at Historic St. Mary City, you please uh, welcome any donations. Um, you can visit our website or, or contact uh, the museum's visitor center about that. So uh, have a good night and thank you very much, Amanda. Yep, thank you.